Hello, and welcome to Unabridged, the weekly podcast where teachers take on books. This is Sarah. Join us for bookish episodes and a monthly book club pick. This is Ashley. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod, or go to our website, unabridgedpod.com, where the books we read are linked for purchase. This is Jen. Check out our Teachers Pay Teachers store, our Patreon page, and our newsletter. Please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts to support us. You want opinions about books? We've got them. Hi, and welcome to Unabridged. This is episode 159. This is our January book club, and we are discussing Darius the Great is Not Okay by Adib Karam. Before we get started today, we just wanted to share with you how much joy we get out of seeing your personal reviews that you all are sharing on Apple Podcasts. It is so great to hear your thoughts, and it also gives us a chance to widen our audience. So if you want to support the podcast, a great way to do that is to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening, and we appreciate that so very much. We're going to go ahead and get started with the way we start every episode with our bookish check-in. Jen, what are you reading? So I am, we are recording in December, and I am trying to finish the last few books I need for my reading challenges. And so one of them that I needed for the tournament of books is Patrick DeWitt's The Sisters Brothers. So I just started that one yesterday. I absolutely love it. It is a Western It kind of reminds me of Charles Portis's True Grit in its tone and its dry wit. So this is about two brothers whose last name is Sisters, and it's Charles and Eli. And Eli is narrating, and they are bounty hunters, basically, who travel around the United States to kill people. (laughs) And so they are on their way to California to kill someone for their boss and they have a lot of problems. So Charles is an alcoholic and is constantly getting so sick that they have to stay at a hotel for extra time. Charles is always trying to improve himself. At one point he goes on a diet because he feels like he wants to find love and that will help him find love with this particular woman who basically (laughs) tells him that he's too overweight for her. And they, so he keeps having these moments where he's trying to be healthier, or trying to get slimmer or trying to be kinder. And then inevitably something happens and he's just right back in the fact that he's an assassin who was traveling across the country to kill someone, <laughs> <laughs> So, which I know all sounds really horrible, but is that dark humor. I absolutely love it. I actually, well, I will, I will spare you. I marked some quotations, but I don't think I can do them justice because the voice in this is so, so strong. So yeah, I'm a big fan of Westerns. I grew up watching a lot of them with my dad and it's a great read. I wasn't expecting to be enjoying it quite this much, but it's really, really good. So that is Patrick DeWitt's The Sisters Brothers. That sounds fascinating. I think I would enjoy that one. It's really good. (laughs) (laughs) What about you, Sarah? What are you reading? I am reading Rachel Hawkins's The Wife Upstairs. I cannot wait to read this one. So I got this on Libro FM's ALC program. And so I'm listening to it and it's fantastic on audio. And lately I have just been trying to, I'm having a really difficult time reading and I'm trying to pick books that I, that are going to capture my interest and have a compelling plot so I can get back into reading because it has just been really difficult. I have all these awesome literary fiction books that I need to read, but I just, I'm having a tough time. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to get some momentum going into the rest of January and, and hopefully being more successful in my reading challenge Mm -hmm. for 2021. So anyway, so I'm reading, so I picked the wife upstairs because I knew it was a suspense thriller-ish type of book. And I tell you, I'm almost finished. So I'm going to really try not to give any spoilers, but it it has been very compelling. The premise of the book is that there is this character named Jane and she, the book opens with her and she is a dog walker in this kind of high class neighborhood in Birmingham, Alabama. And she, the day, one of the days when she's walking the dog, the the dogs in the neighborhood, she accidentally on purpose meets this man who has, that she finds is, it has lost his wife that she is missing. And 
Jane has a sketchy past that is a mystery throughout the book. And there are these moments where the, the man seems really sketchy, but there are also these interspersing chapters of the wife who has gone missing. And I don't want to, I mean, there some things are kind of given away in the very beginning, but I just don't want to take anything away. So that's all I'm going to say about it. But it, it has been really great. And I have been dying to get my earbuds in. My husband is like, you have your earbuds in all the time, <laughs> but I just want to, I mean, I just want to know what's going to happen. So, and I'm also finding for me during this season of difficulty reading, the audiobooks have been a lifesaver because I think I just have a lot on my plate right now. And so I'm able to do the things that I need to do, but also have my earbuds in and get some reading done. So that is Rachel Hawkins's The Wife Upstairs. That comes out we're recording in December, so that comes out January 5th, so it's a new release, but I liked it so far, and I'm right at the end, and I, I feel pretty satisfied from it, so. I'm so excited. It's a Jane Eyre retelling, yeah, and I it has love that Jane Eyre. Me feel, yeah, so I think you'll like it. I mean, again, it is a suspense book, mm -hmm. so you have to go, <laughs> go in knowing that, but I that's what I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. I, I didn't download that one because thrillers are not always my thing, but sometimes I really enjoy them. And that all sounds really compelling, Sarah. So I may go back and see if it's still where I can do that because I think that sounds like it's one that I would enjoy. I will say none of the characters, none of them are particularly likable. So if that is something that you search for in a novel, then that might, that might not be the book for you. That's because true. I, I do find that off-putting sometimes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's low stakes, though. One of the yeah. things I'm going to work on for 2021 is not finishing books. I'm really going to make an effort to not mark things the second that I start reading them because I find that once I've marked that I'm reading it, then I am bound and determined to finish it. And sometimes that is a terrible mistake. So I am really looking to just try stuff. And then if I start it and I hate it, it's okay to stop. And I think I'm hoping that that'll help me with traction, Sarah, because I have that. The problem for me is that I get bogged down by yeah. these books that I'm determined to finish, but it's taking me months to finish them. And then because of that, other than things that I have an external deadline for, I'm just dragging my feet because I'm not yeah. enjoying the book, but I'm not willing yeah. to give it up. And I really want to work on just saying this one's not the one for me, or it's not the one for me right now. And it's okay to just let it go. So yeah. So then that'll enable me to try some thrillers. <laughs> <laughs> see, whether, see whether they work. <laughs> what are like you, great sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You're forgiven. <laughs> what are you reading, Ashley? So I am reading Marie Lou's Sky ah. Hunter. <laughs> and I feel like I've said on here probably not as much as I feel in my heart, but I love Marie Lou. So I have gu gushed about that at least a little bit. I don't know that it is to the full degree, but I just love her works. And I think one of the things I really love is that she does a great job of grounding you as the reader in a world that is not our current world. And that I need that. I have found with fantasy and sci-fi, I'm not so adept of a reader in those genres that I can just go wherever the author wants you to go. But she does a really nice job. So this one is post-apocalyptic. It is clearly quite futuristic. It appears that our world is long gone and they're kind of the the old ones that they only know little bits and pieces of like more of what our structure was like. But they do have these societies in place and the there is an empire of sorts that's working to dominate all these different independent countries. And so Talon is the main character. She was a refugee and her country was absorbed by the empire. So she and her mom fled. It was brutal. She experienced becoming a refugee. And then she faces a lot of the real life discrimination that refugees often face. And so there's a lot of that in the book. So she's in Mara, but she is not Marin. And because of that, she does not have all of the kind of privilege and social status that would make her life experiences easier. And that's true of, of her mom as well, who she really tries to care for. But she becomes friends with a high standing Marin 
early on in her life. And when that happens, she is able to become a striker. And that is kind of an elite, kind of like an army position where they are combat fighters. He's her partner. And because he vouched for her, even though she's a refugee, she's able to become a striker. But her but her role is always a little bit tenuous because it's linked to his status, essentially. And so their fighters, she the the job of the strikers is to go out to the the frontier kind of like their borderlands and there are these ghosts they call them ghosts out there it's these genetically modified creatures that used to be human but they are horrific and they're they're somewhat zombie like i mean it's there's some of that super strong if you're bitten you're going to be kill you'll you'll become one too so then they have to kill you know that's why they have to go out in pairs is so that if they are struck by one of the ghosts that they can be killed and so it's a pretty it's a brutal but valued role in their society and because of it she's able to to care for her mom which again is very important to her but early on some things happen that i don't want to reveal and that makes her position even more tenuous and then the strikers have a prisoner and they do executions of prisoners of war. And in that moment, Talon has this feeling about the prisoner that things are not what they seem. And so she essentially vouches for the prisoner's life and then winds up tied into that. So things ensue from there that are really fascinating. And I, like I said, I think what I love, it's a very compelling story, but I love how, and I think Marie Lou does this really nicely in a lot of her books. She's exploring a lot of the complex issues like refugee status in our world, but she does it within these like dystopian, futuristic, post-apocalyptic societies and I just find it really fascinating and I love her character building I think she does that really well and then like I said I think for people who are not I I mean I love fantasy and I love sci-fi but I find that I don't read them often enough so if you are somebody who you enjoy those types of books she does a great job of just really grounding the reader right at the beginning and you know exactly what's going on and I've found that that's important to me in, in in those genres so again that's Marie Lu and this is her new one that came out this fall called Sky Hunter, and it's the first in a series. I have that one on my TBR stack. I'm hoping to get to it very, very soon. I'm loving it. So I'm, I'm excited to see what you think. <laughs> We're going to transition into talking about Darius the Great is Not Okay. This one has been on my TBR list for a long time. Jen has been recommending it to me for a long time, and somehow I still hadn't gotten to it, and I'm so glad I finally did. Once again, whenever it's my book club turn, I forget the summary. Forgive me, listeners. So I'm going to just tell you about what happens in the book. Darius is a teenager in America. His mom is Persian and his dad is American. And he finds that he is struggling with navigating that because he has Persian heritage, which he loves, but he does not speak Farsi. He has not been to Iran. So he feels distant from the Persian connection, and yet also not, not, you know, he has that part that he's trying to explore. He also struggles with depression throughout his adolescence and has been on medication for it for a long period of time, but is still navigating how to share that with others, how to talk about that, how to work through some of the stigmas that come, that he feels come with that. And then a lot of the book and what we'll be getting into is about his family. His grandfather has a brain tumor and it and it is terminal. And so a lot of the story is about his family making their very first trip for him and his sister to Iran. And so a lot of the story takes place there where he meets his extended family and spends time there. And so I think that's a lot of what we'll explore. So overall impressions. Sarah, what is your overall impression? I hadn't really read a lot about this. I had seen it on on lists and I know that I'd, I'd heard Jen talk about it, but I just didn't really know anything about it. And I don't know, <laughs> when we picked it for book club, I knew that Jen had thought it was worthy. So I, did, I just had not seen a lot about this book. And in my mind, I had I had no idea what it was about. And when <laughs> I started reading it, I was I was... 
I had one I well actually I should say I had one idea in my mind what it was about and when I started I was like oh that's not what that's about at all but I, <laughs> this I, happens so, to me sometimes too I will say <laughs> well I think I just seen the cover and then I don't know I just thought it was going to be something different but anyway I did enjoy it I thought I think it is a great book for young adults the topics the Persian culture all of that is something I'm very unfamiliar with and I was thought it was fascinating to get to to read about that and also see how Darius navigates his American heritage but also in trying to honor his Persian heritage and I don't know. I just really thought Darius was a very relatable character. I thought the my very favorite thing was his relationship with his sister and how he was just so precious with her. And I, I just I liked it. I think it has a lot of great discussable things for students. I think it would be a great book for the classroom because I think the Persian culture is underrepresented in, in my literature. And I think that it's very important that we are having our students be aware of other things outside of themselves and outside of their own experience. So I think for all those reasons, I loved it. I think it would be great for the classroom. And I think it's a great story. And it's, it was, I was crying at the end. (laughs) Oh, me too. Big time. (laughs) What about you, Jen? Overall impression? Well, yeah, as has been established, I love this one. This was one of my top reads last year. It made it onto our best books of the year episode because I just, I love everything about it. I love Darius. I love the way he is navigating so many important relationships in his life. And I think his approach to the world is, is really funny sometimes. So he loves Star Trek and he, he characterizes things. He'll call things like level level seven tragedies or level, level seven disasters. He sort of has this way of approaching the world where he's trying to categorize it and to make it make sense of himself that I think is both relatable and really funny. I think he has a great sense of humor about things. And I just, yeah, I mean, I can't wait till we dig into it because as Sarah was saying, I think I keep envisioning having conversations with students about it because he deals with bullying and he deals, there's a I wouldn't say there's a romance, but certainly I think we see him developing feelings for someone. And I think his sibling relationship is great. I love watching him navigate his relationship with his dad and then meeting his grandparents. His relationship with his grandmother is just one of the sweetest things. When he talks about her hugs, it's, it's, yeah, he's just such a sweet kid. And so I think the second time around, I was also really focused on his parents and thinking of my own kids and the ways that sometimes the things we do to try to protect our kids are the things that make them self-conscious about about how they are. And I know we'll get into that. But yeah, it's just amazingly complex and nuanced and I think just brilliant. I could go on and on. And yeah, I just absolutely love it. So Ashley, how about you? Yeah, like I said, this one had been long anticipated for me, and I absolutely loved it. Like Sarah, I did not know much at all about it. I realized when I started that although it had been something I really wanted to read, I didn't know much. I didn't really expect in the beginning that his family would go to Iran. So I loved how it transitioned from what he was experiencing with the bullying and just sort of the typical teenage experience of trying to find yourself amid and I mean social dynamics in high school and all of that and then and I and I loved that I thought there was a lot of interesting exploration but then when his family took the trip I just thought that was so richly drawn and I loved learning about Iran I don't know a lot about it and certainly not the things that I've read have been more about the cultural revolution or like historical fiction, not just everyday life. I mean, I loved the things he said as he observed yachts and he was realizing kind of these stereotypes he was bringing to the table of assumptions he thought and didn't know that he thought until he saw Sorab with his phone. And then he's like, oh yeah, he has an iPhone. You know, it's those kinds of things that I think, again, I think American students who are reading this could really identify with some of those assumptions that you don't even know you're making until you're 
faced with something that's different. And then you realize you've brought this assumption to the table. And so I loved all of that. I also really loved all the stuff with the tea. I loved all of that. So I felt like, like Jen said about his, the way that he categorized things, I, I really enjoyed that. And I also really enjoyed his love of tea making and the art of tea and how that was so much a part of him. Separate from Persian culture, it was his thing that he Mm -hmm. had become really passionate about. And so I loved that. And then I also thought that there's a lot to be learned about how to navigate things, both on the kid side and on the parent side. I think there's a lot of... I loved how a lot of things were said out loud and explored and that that helped all the characters through the journey. I thought all of that was really beautiful too. Okay, so we we will try to specify some things that worked for us out of some of the things we mentioned for overall. So what's something that worked for you, Jen? (sighs) I wanted to talk about all the things. Okay, so I'm going to focus on Darius's relationship with his dad, who he calls most of the time, he calls him Steve Kellner, both names. He also calls him the Teutonic (laughs) Ubermensch. So his dad is blonde and super handsome, super successful. He also suffers from anxiety and also and depression and is on medication. And I think a lot of their relationship is based on the ways that Darius thinks his dad views him. And that a lot of those things are misunderstandings based on his own insecurities. And his dad sometimes is completely oblivious. So his dad does not always make the right choices. But I think one thing that I really appreciated is I think so often when you see a parent teenager relationship, it's either all good or all bad. And so I really appreciated in this one that even though Darius's relationship with his father is contentious and resentful and his dad is constantly trying to get, for example, Darius is overweight and his dad is constantly trying to get him to only eat salad and frowning at him if he opts to have dessert. But they also have these great moments like they watch Star Trek together. That becomes a moment of contention later because they invite or his dad invites his little sister to watch, too. But they have that. They have these moments of communication because they are sort of on the outside of this Persian culture. Neither one of them speaks Farsi. Uh, They have these sort of shortcuts to the way that they're supposed to dress based on what someone in the Persian culture says it's casual and they're like, oh, it's Persian casual. And they know what that means. So they have all these little moments too. And I just think that's what it's more often like. I think most teenagers have conflicts with their parents, but it's not like they are constantly at each other's throats. And so I loved seeing that developed in a way that made it seem real. And I think watching them come around to being able to communicate with each other was such a beautiful thing. And seeing the way that this trip was a catalyst for that, that it sort of made everything coalesce in a way that maybe had they been in their routines at home, they never would have been pushed to have some of the conversations they have here and seeing all of them because Darius's grandfather is dying. They're all keenly aware. It's never said as a cliche that you have to make, that you have to honor what you have today or that you have to realize what you have today. But I got that feeling that they are all aware that this man is dying, that they maybe don't have the relationships that they wish they had with him. And so let's value the relationships that we do have, that we can still nurture and help grow. And yeah, I just, yeah, I just loved everything about Steve Kellner and Darius and the way that relationship grows through the book. So sorry, that was a little rambly, but There's a lot in there. It's just such a rich, rich book. And that relationship, I think, is a rich center for it. Yeah. And I feel like because of what evolves at the end, when they have that really honest conversation with each other, it helps to show, again, from the parent side, I think something that I took away was that a lot of times we try to protect our children from things we think they cannot know. And Mm -hmm. in doing that, sometimes what we're doing is creating a void that they fill 
with their own assumptions and that those are totally mismarked. And so I think I really appreciated that in the end because I understood why his dad had tried to protect him from his own depression when it got to such a a hard place. And yet because of that, Darius was old enough to understand something happened. And because he didn't know that was what happened and that had never been explained to him after he drew all these conclusions that were totally misguided. And like you said, Jen, that those really hurt his relationship every single moment, that everything Mm -hmm. that his dad said was then colored by this feeling that his dad did not want to be with him. And so I just thought all of that was really rich because again, I think that that is a struggle that, that we have with people we love is like, how do we, have an open relationship, but also protect them Mm -hmm. when they are in our care and we don't want to hurt them. So. Well, unlike when he would, that we're trying to work through the bullying and his dad kept giving him tips about ways to be more normal. So the other kids wouldn't pick on him. And I just kept thinking his dad, it's so misguided, but you could see that it was coming from a place of love that he was just desperate to help Darius. He didn't know what to do. But he just kept making him feel so bad about himself because it was always in comparison with the standard that he thought his dad was setting. And so just watching them continue to miss each other there in those. Yeah, it's. Again, it really made me think about my own parenting. (laughs) So anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like missed moments. I feel like there was a lot in the book about ways to kind of take advantage of a moment instead of missing it. What about you, Sarah? What what worked for you? I think the way that the author treats the teenage experience, especially for someone like Darius, who, who is picked on, I really liked how Darius kept calling the attention to the zero tolerance policy for bullying and all that, because that is true. Everybody... All, every school that I've ever worked at or that I've ever visited say so they have a zero tolerance for bullying. But then things I've also, in the same token, I have seen things that like what happened to Darius happen to other, for, to students in schools here all the time. And I think it happens all the time. So I just thought it was really interesting the way that the author has Darius have that at our forefront the whole time. And I think, again, when I think about students reading this book, I mean, I think that is really impactful. And I think that the author's use of repetition throughout the book is really, really clever. I mean, it just makes you think just like when Darius says that's normal, right? Or, you know, that, that same line all the time. And I just think, gosh, this for, I guess, I guess what I want to say in summarizing this rambly is that I think that what I love about this book and what worked the most for me is its ability to reach students in the classroom, because I think the author does a really good job of making a really readable text. But like you said, Jen, it has a ton of complexity and a lot of nuance in it that would make it such a good book to teach. I mean, like I said, and when I was talking about my overall impressions, not only about the Persian culture, but just about the awareness of what, what it is to be bullied. And I think a lot of, a lot of kids may think that like, if you call someone D bag or whatever it is, you know, that that's not bullying or that's not affecting the person that that you're just joking around. But I think that, that he does a good job, the author of showing like how that affects Darius and, why it affects him the way that it does. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think that for me, this book, I mean, just the whole time I was reading it, I thought how awesome it would be to be able to open up a conversation in the classroom using this as the kind of the source material. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to narrow it down to one thing that worked, but I feel like you have both touched on some things that I thought were really significant. So something that I loved was that we haven't covered a whole lot yet is the way that Karam shows living with depression. And I loved that about the slingshot maneuver of emotions. I just felt like, I mean, that, that is very relatable to me. And I think it's relatable to a lot of people that you can feel your moods do that. And it is really hard and you can't stop it. And I just loved the way that 
Darius could see that happening in himself, but he could not stop it. And I think that that is really powerful because, again, it gives us a chance to empathize with other people and to recognize that that happens to other people, too. And it gives us space to forgive ourselves when that happens to us, because I think that we cannot help. I mean, it's all the things. It's how a situation that could feel really great can suddenly be colored in a different light. And it feels awful. And so I just love that because I think teens need to see that. And it goes with what you said, Jen, about the nuances of the relationship between the father and son. I feel like that depiction of Darius was really nuanced as well. That It's not that he cannot get out of bed anytime, but it is that he is on a precipice a lot of the time where he is totally okay and feeling okay in one moment. And then the next moment he is not at all. And again, I just think that is really relatable, certainly to teens. But even as an adult, I just think of all the things I work on as an adult, that is probably the thing I have to devote the most energy to of continuing to work on in myself and figuring out how to like navigate when that does happen, how to keep from exploding onto the people around me. And I think all of that I just appreciate because I think that that is part of making peace with yourself and also being kind to yourself and understanding that that is part of human nature and that a lot of people do experience that. And so I just, I loved all of that. I loved the normalization of those mood swings and the way that even though it, I think that Karam helps to normalize that, he does not dismiss it as if to say that it is not a problem and that it's not painful, both for Darius and for the people around him who love him and who want things to be good for him. So I just appreciated all of that. I think it's hard to depict that, but especially in a book that's readable for teens. And I think that he does that really well. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Things that did not work for you. This might be a hard one. (laughs) Um, I wish listeners, I wish you could see their faces are both like, "Mm." (laughs) are there things that did not work or that you would have liked to see be a little different? Uh, Sarah? (laughs) In my mind, I am thinking I should have thought this through because I just, usually in a book, I can find something, but I just really think this one works all around for me. I just can't think of one thing that I would feel comfortable recommending a change on because I think he does. It's just a great, great book for young adults and so I'm, I'm just going to say no. I don't have anything. <laughs> what about you, Jen? You've been I'm through gonna, it a couple of times. Do so yep. you have thoughts about that? I'm going to just take this opportunity to talk about something else that worked for me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, second time through, I think I loved it even more than the first time. I just want to talk about his relationship with So Rob and what it says about friendship and you see Darius because he has been the object of so much bullying and does not have, he has a casual friend at his school who is also Persian, but you see, he meets so Rob, who is his, the, his grandparents neighbor and they strike up this friendship almost immediately. And just his gratitude for someone who understands him and accepts him and just likes him for who he is, is so beautiful and kind of heartbreaking too, that that was the first time he'd felt that at 15, but also I'm so grateful that he found it. So I know that was cheating, but I just, I wanted to mention that because I think it's such a big part of the book as well. So, okay. Sorry, Ashley, was there anything that did not work for you? I'm struggling on it too. I think that I thought it was really solidly done and I'm also going to talk about something I thought was really great. <laughs> they have they cheated. I know. I've been sorry. cheating. Okay, I'll cheated. Give you it. I will allow no, that's it okay. if, if you want to say something. I'll just um, coast on when you're off. I think going back to the nuances, I really loved when – I didn't love. I appreciated when So Rob went off on Darius in that moment where he found out of his dad, because I think it was such a perfect relationship in so many ways. 
but that is real that that the people that we love we do i mean exactly what i said about the slingshot maneuvers and emotions and maybe other people handle that better than me but i do think that all of us have moments where we lash out at the people we love because of something that was not their fault or in this case had nothing to do with them and i really appreciated that whole scene because i think that so rob says out loud again like I said before about normalization of mental health and how important it is to take care of that. And also that it is a real experience that people are having. He says out loud, a lot of these horrible things that unfortunately people do think about people with chronic depression, where he's like, you don't have anything to be sad about. You've never had anything bad happen to you. And we know that Darius is acutely aware that that's part of his he that makes it worse for him that he feels that way and we've seen him work through that and we've seen him work through it with so rob but i loved how later on when they are repairing that how so rob says i was hurting and i said exactly what it took to hurt you and i think those conversations are often not said in such an outward and eloquent way but i do think that that is the work that has to be done in relationships to get through those things and i love how throughout the book that was just one of the things i really loved is both what was said and what was not said like sarah said about i loved how he was constantly like that's normal right mm-hmm. and and again i think teens who are reading that can really identify with that feeling and i also loved in the dialogue all the uses of um and ah uh, and uh and actually writing out his inability to say the thing in response to someone because again I think that's so relatable and it's kind of funny I mean there are a lot of parts where it's it's a funny thing to read the person saying all this stuff and then Darius going um <laughs> <laughs> but I think that seeing all that on the page is just really great so I I just it's, I wanted to say that that was something that I think could not work for people, but it worked for me. And it, it meant a lot to me that it was in there because I think it made the relationship more real and showed that all relationships, even when they're great, are not perfect and that they are going to have problems, especially when there's an external event that's really catastrophic. So, okay, we are going to, unless anyone wants to say anything else, we're going to move on to our quotes. And we each chose just one quote to share, though I do believe this is a very quotable book, but we chose just one. Jen, what's your quote? I actually have two, but I'm only going to read one. I'm not going to cheat this time. I am going to do this one. He asks, Darius asks, how could I be a tourist in my own past? And I think that is another really powerful element of this book. So one of the things that makes him a target of bullying is the fact that of his ethnicity, of the fact that he is Persian. And so he is very aware of that part of himself and feels an affinity for it. And yet he also feels on the outside of it. So it's this, he is constantly trying to reconcile this fact that because of his Persian heritage, he is seen as an outsider, but he's also an outsider in in that. And so I think being able to go to Iran and to tour around and to see all of these landmarks that are significant to his history and to learn about his own past and to get to know his grandparents and these stories about them. I think that's something we all have to do. I think even in the United States, I think there are things about our own country's history that I don't know. I think there are places I haven't been. And so I think at some point we are all tourists in our own past. But I think for him, because he has to travel such a distance and because it's not easily accessible, that's emphasized. And just his desire to understand that about himself, I think is also great that he is not this teenager who's constantly bored and just doesn't want to see anything. He is so hungry to understand that part of himself. And so he loves his sister Lale, but he also has some conflicts because his mom has done a great job. She has taught Lale Farsi and Lale has this way of communicating then with their family and with their friends when they go to Iran that Darius doesn't have. And so there's another place that he feels on the outside of. He sees that his mom and his sister have this bond that he doesn't have. So I just think that simple phrasing, how could I be a tourist in my own past? It opens up this whole subplot of the novel that I think is really, really important 
for teenagers, but for everyone to think about their own heritage and their own culture and our own knowledge of what came before. Yeah. What about you, Sarah? What's yours? My favorite scene in the whole book, it, and I, well, the one that made it seem was so impactful for me was when Darius is on the roof, his dad finds him on the roof after Darius's fight with Sorab. And the quote is, his dad says, I know. And then it says, he rubbed my back up and down. It's okay not to be okay. And I think this is such an impactful moment. I was sobbing during this scene yeah. because I, mm-hmm. it was just such a revelation for Darius that to be seen by his dad and for his dad to share that story about his own experience with depression and why he stopped reading the stories. And then his dad giving Darius permission to be who he is and, and the ability for, and, and get, acknowledging and giving permission the ability to feel the way he wanted to feel. And I just found that so poignant in the book and I just loved it. So that is my quote. And I loved the way, like Jen was talking about earlier. I just love the, the way that the relationship between Darius and his dad developed over the course of the story. And then that having that moment that just where they actually both saw each other. I just thought that was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Oh my gosh. And yeah, the sobs. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I just thought, I mean, like I said before, that I could see why his dad made those choices. But then I think because we see, and I don't blame him for those because it is an awful thing to try to explain to your child who you love because it, it could make your child draw these conclusions that of course his dad didn't want him to draw. It wasn't Darius's fault. It had nothing to do with Darius or his mom. And so I could see why he wanted to protect him from that information. But because of that, we see, because, because the book is told from Darius's point of view, we see how he sees his dad as perfect. And of course we see how his dad is not perfect and is working through things and has really had struggles. And so it is in that moment that I just think it's really rich because it shows why we, keep things from people we love, but also how, how that can really cause damage. So I thought that was great. What about you, Ashley? What's your quote? I had a hard time picking. I am going to go with this one. I chose the thing is I never had a friend like Sora before one who understood me without even trying, who knew what it was like to be stuck on the outside because of one little thing that set you apart. And I loved that because Again, we see the story from his perspective. So we do see as he meets Sorab the ease of their relationship and how quickly and easily they get to know each other and become such wonderful and beautiful friends. But also Sorab is Baha'i. And so there's this whole, again, I mean, like Jen said, we could we could explore the subplots of this. For days. I mean, so there's a whole nother part happening here where his family is discriminated against because of being Baha'i. And that's something Darius doesn't even really know much about because he's kind of like, well, my family is Zoroastrian and that's also not the dominant religion. And so Rob's like, yeah, but that's different because it's accepted in a way that Baha'i is not. And so we see all of that. And of course, his dad being put in, in prison is awful. And I think that what I appreciate about it is that I think Adib Karam does such a great job of painting this beautiful place in Yads that is a phenomenal experience and showing all the cultural aspects of Iran, but he also does not gloss over the parts of the regime that are problematic and the ways that those can play out for an individual family. And, and again, I think in a very approachable way for teens, but I think it's showing that, I mean, just like we talked about in the relationships between people and that those are not all good or all bad, countries are not all good or all bad. And countries have beautiful parts and things to celebrate, but they also have decisions that governments make that are horrible and also that can impact, you know, families in really, in really awful ways, as happens with So Rob's dad. So I just love that because I think that he makes that connection to somebody else because of all the things we've talked about, about the ways that Darius is on the outside of so many different things in his life. And that, that happens to so Rob too. Okay. We're going to, I feel like we could talk about this all day, but we are going to transition and talk about 
our pairings. So Sarah, what was what was the one you chose? I chose Sarah Moon Sparrow. This book is about a girl named Sparrow. She has difficulty making friends. She would rather stay home with her mom on the weekends than than play with others. And so she's really been lonely in school. And she had a teacher that was who was a librarian that really meant a lot to her and would let her eat lunch in the library at school so she didn't have to be around people. And the teacher passes away unexpectedly. And it kind of sends Sparrow into a spiral. So why I think this is a good pairing for Darius the Great is not okay is because this book addresses mental health issues. It talks about therapy and how therapy can help. And, and it, it, the book is about Sparrow working through things in her life and with the help of her therapist and some different types of alternative type things that she can do to help herself kind of get through what she's going through at the moment. So I think that it has some of those mental health aspects that Darius the Great, it, it addresses some of those. And I think that it's a really quick read. It is, I don't, I don't love it as much as Darius the Great, but I think it would be a great option in, for students kind of playing on the same thing of a, of a, teen, a teenager who is lonely, she's not comfortable in her own skin, and is working through mental health issues. That sounds great. I haven't read that one. I yeah, either. I have it. You guys can borrow it. And so that's Sarah Moon Sparrow. What about you, Jen? What's your pick? So my pick is Erica L. Sanchez's I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter. And we did this one. It's been a few seasons now. It may not be available anymore, but it's it's an earlier episode, one of our book clubs. It, it I, I think this in the vault, yeah, I, think. <laughs> I think it's in the vault too. But I just, we all love this book. And I think there are a number of parallels with Darius the Great is not okay. I think one of them is that the protagonist, Julia, is also dealing with mental illness and she is trying to work her way through that. She has a lot of cultural expectations, particularly from her mom, that she is just not sure she wants to follow the way her mom thinks things should be done. And just on the surface, there's also this really revelatory trip for Julia where she goes back to her parents' home village in Mexico. And that trip for her is this clarifying experience that just helps her to see herself in a different way, just as Darius's trip with his family to Iran helps him understand himself better. So I think that one too had some humor to it, but also some dark moments. And in that story, just to give you a tiny bit of summary, Julia's sister has just died. And Julia's sister was the perfect Mexican daughter. And Julia was continually comparing herself to her sister and thinking of herself as, as the title says, she is not the perfect Mexican daughter. So she, for a long time, sort of escaped her parents' expectations a little bit because her sister was there. But then when they all descend upon her, she really struggles with it. So in that case, Julia's sister is older. So that's different from Darius and his little sister, Lale. But I also think we see that siblings compare themselves to the other and sometimes it can, that, that comparison can be really damaging, even if you really love your sibling. So yeah, I just think on the surface and and deeper, but there are just all of these connections. I think these books really, they're, they're very resonant with each other. Also, this is not an official pairing, but when we were talking about the bullying, I can't help but shout out if you have, Teenagers who need to read about that topic, A.S. King's Everybody Sees the Ants. Ashley and I taught that book. That book was one of the first that I had seen treat bullying in a realistic, powerful way. It's it's an amazing book anyway, but I think we just had some great conversations with students because it doesn't try to arrive at simple answers. And so I just think if you work with teenagers or have teenagers at home, that book is really powerful. So sorry for the, I'm just cheating all over the place this episode, but I I couldn't resist shouting that one out because I think it's important. Yeah. And just to piggyback on that, I think the other thing that we found is that we were working with juniors 
for that particular experience. But we found that kids really do want to discuss bullying. And that was a surprise to me. So I think that I think I brought that assumption because as a teacher, because when there are events that relate to bullying, there's a lot of eye rolling. Kids are always like, <laughs> and that that's, I'm not judging that. I'm just saying that I think because of that, I assumed that kids did not want to talk with me about bullying. And so I wouldn't have chosen that book, but when given an opportunity to vote on things that they wanted to discuss, that was the overwhelming winner of the long list of social issues we provided. So I just wanted to share that as well for teachers who are listening that you might be surprised. And for us who have children who are in the age where they're experiencing that, you might be surprised by how interested they are in discussing that. Because like Sarah was saying earlier, it is just pervasive in their lives. And it's not always that they're the target but many times they are a bystander and they don't know what to do. And I just think, and unfortunately, like I said about the eye rolling, a lot of the ways that we do try to address it are not helpful to kids. And so having a book that we can anchor ourselves to, to have conversations and give them a space to explore some of those issues in a way that relates to the plot, I think is really helpful. Well, yeah. And I think one of the things that causes the eye rolls is it sounds really simple to say, stand up for yourself yeah. or stand up for someone else. Don't be silent. And it sounds super easy to say those things, but those are really hard things for anyone to do. And I think it's not always realistic to think that those are going to solve the problem. And so I think that books that deal with it in a realistic way are really important to put in front of kids so that they can see something that echoes their real experience. And and that does mean that it doesn't say, here are the five things you can do to stop bullying in your life because that's not how it works. So I hate that it's, it doesn't give easy solutions, but I also think that's the reality. So anyway, sorry. Okay. Ashley, what's your pick? I when I had a lot that came to my mind for this one too. So maybe we'll do a bookish fave that's, that celebrates some of these young adult books that I think hit on a lot of these issues of mental health, of bullying. I think there are a lot of great ones out there that may not cover such a spectrum that this book does, but that can address some of the issues within this one. But I wanted to share David Yoon's Frankly in Love. I know David Yoon and Nicola Yoon are another are another one I have um, fangirled a lot about. But I wanted to share this one because I think so Frank Lee is the main character, hence the pun in the title. And he is Korean American and he actually calls himself a limbo because that is his classification for people who are neither what he deems true Koreans nor American. And I think that the part of the book that complements this one so well is that exploration of identity and how your own identity as a um, as a teen growing, you know, as a kid who is born in America, grows up in America, but has a parent of a cultural heritage that is different than American, the struggles of all of that. So I think the exact same types of things that Darius is working through with Farsi and with with the tea making and, you know, what is considered normal for Persians versus like what he loves as a, as a tea maker and a connoisseur of tea, all of that stuff, frankly, is navigating a lot of that as well. And he has all these expectations from his parents that are, he feels are forced upon him, but he does love them. And he, I mean, and I think that part is similar to that his relationship with his parents is not perfect, but it's also not terrible. And he is wanting to please them, but he also, like we all find as we, especially for teens, he also wants to live his own life and make his own choices. And so he's really navigating that. So the struggles for him are a lot related to romance. And a big thing for his parents is that they want him to date Korean girls only. And so he is working through that in a lot of the books. So it is a light read in some ways, but it does touch on a lot of really important issues. I was amazed by how much ground Yoon covered about the, the transition to college, about the relationships between the, the feeling of not fitting in in any location. I think there's a lot of that for Frank in the book. And also about 
your relationships with your family. There's a lot of exploration of that and and that one that I think is really rich. Again, that's David Yoon's Frankly in Love. And I think it is different in some ways. It doesn't take on some of the things that Adib Karam covers here, but I think it complements really nicely. And I also think it's a great example of a male protagonist who's working through things like romance and feelings for others and a sense of self like you see that really well with frankly so i think that it works well in that way too i love that book yeah, so that good great. so we wanted to wrap up with our bookish hearts uh sarah what what's your number five bookish hearts for the young adults and as a teacher five bookish hearts Loved what about it. Yeah, good. What about you, John? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was like, I cut you off there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Five. Five bookish hearts. Ashley? Well, it's an echo in here because it's five, <laughs> five bookish hearts for me too. I just think, I think the things we talked about, that it is so broad in scope and yet so readable. And I think that's yeah. really hard to do. So that's, I think, and so readable and so teachable. And I think mm-hmm. that, that all of that is really great. I did think of one thing to say that we didn't really touch on for students. It also has a, a lot of humor in it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, there were parts where I was l- laughing out loud. So I think that's also a great thing for students when they're reading about stuff that's pretty heavy. There, there are moments of levity and that's nice too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry. No, I, I guess that, yeah. I had to add in my one other thing that I liked at some point. I just did. I'm going to say different for the end. Yeah, <laughs> right. different end. I like it. Okay, we wanted to finish with our Give Me One. And today we are, choose, this topic came from our unabridged ambassadors. If you, <laughs> we, we love them. They are our life force and <laughs> and help us in so many ways. And so if you are interested in joining the ambassadors, you can just go to unabridgedpod.com slash ambassadors to sign up. But we get so many great ideas from them. And one of the things that they've shared is just suggestions for episodes and also for Give Me One Topics. And one that was shared is a series you want to finish but haven't. So Sarah, what's your pick? So Ashley, in one of our episodes, when we recommend books for each other, she recommended Lee Bardugo's Six of Crows to me. And I read it and I adored it. I thought it was so compelling. And I I love fantasy books like that. And I just loved it. So I loved it. But then I just had so much other stuff to read. And fantasy books tend to be on the longer side. I have not yet read Crooked Kingdom. I do have Jen's copies stacked in my my office that has been overtaken by books. And I would like to finish that series because I really enjoyed Six of Crows. Yeah, I can't wait to see what you think. I loved that one. And I'm finding duologies are a good are a good number for me. That I if there are two, I think I can do that. I do love the continuity, but I'm also having trouble with getting back to series for sure. I could have listed a lot of series, of series for this one. Um, Jen, what about you? What's your pick? So mine is Neil Schusterman's Scythe series. I love Schusterman. I think he is brilliant. And Scythe was great. There is not, sometimes there's a reason I haven't gone back to a series, but this one, there's no reason. I just have not continued. That's a trilogy. Sometimes I think with trilogies, the first book is great. And then it kind of goes downhill. But I've heard that this one lands, that the third book is a lot of people's favorite. So I need to get back to it. And yeah, maybe that's one of my 2021 goals. We'll see. I have, a, I feel like I'm going to have a lot of those. I keep like saying things in my head. Oh yeah, I should do that in 2021. Anyway. <laughs> Ashley, what's your, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that's what 2020 has done to us. Is, <laughs> is that now we have a long list of <laughs> goals and aspirations for, for sure. 2021. Ashley, what's your series? So like I said, I've kind of picked a, a lot of different books for this one, but I am going to go with Bridget Kamara's a curse so dark and lonely. Mm -hmm. I loved the first book so much. And the second one came out this past, the beginning of 2020 is when that one was released. And I was so excited to read it and then didn't. But now the new one is coming out this month. I'm not sure the exact date. So it might actually be out before this episode releases, but it's right around now. And I, and I've also found that works really well for me Mm -hmm. to get the momentum going, 
and to go ahead and do all of them at once. I actually enjoy that experience more. It's hard, like Sarah was saying, it's hard to make time for it because the series are often long. And so if you're trying to read all of them in a short time, that can be tough. But I have found the ones that I love the most when I look back over my reading history are the ones that I read that I had access to all of them. And so, and I do think I remember the first one quite well. I could read it again because it moved quickly if I wanted to, but I think that I remember it well enough to where I could jump into book two and then go ahead and read two and three. And I hope to do that. Yeah. I want to get back to that one as well. I'm the same, same way. I've had the second book sitting on my Kindle. I think I pre-ordered it and just didn't get back to it, but I think book three's publication will be a good, good little push. Yeah, for me too. And I, I just thought that was a great story and, and hit on a lot of things. So it is fun to read and moves fast, but also covers a lot of topics that I found really interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, we hope that you all have enjoyed our discussion of Adib Karam's Darius the Great is Not Okay. We we definitely enjoyed talking about it. And, and we can't wait to hear what you think about this book. And if you have pairings, as well, we would love to hear those because, again, like we shared, we think these are this is a great book for the classroom and for teens. And so we're always looking to add to those lists. Oh, and this is our buddy read for this month. So if you would like to join, we're talking about that on the 11th and the 25th. So just let us know if you want to join our IG buddy read chat. Yes. And you can DM us to let us know at Unabridged Pod or you can you can send us an email, anything like that. We can sign you up. So thanks so much for listening. Do you have comments or opinions about what you heard today? We'd love to hear them. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Underbridge Pod or on the web at underbridgepod.com for a list of ways to support us. We'd like to thank Jared Featherstone, who composed our theme music, Strings of Light, and Katie Amy of Amy Photography, our podcast photographer. Thanks for listening to Unabridged.